With that, we move on to the third keynote, and we have the pleasure of Sir Martin Sorel, founder and executive chairman, S4 Capital, and founder WPP in conversation with Sonali Krishna, anchor and editor ET Now. Before I hand over the floor to Sonali, a brief introduction to Sir Martin Sorel. Great white sharks cannot stop swimming. If they do, they suffocate and die. Similarly, our next speaker who loves to eat sweet and sour meatballs finds it hard to stand still. In fact, the story of his rise would make great material for Mad Men creator Matthew Weiner. A child whose father fought anti-Semitism before changing the family name, an entrepreneur who invested in a wire basket making company, a businessman who pursued hostile takeovers and was called out by David Ogilvy because of that, and was later knighted by the Queen, says that the success is never ending for him. Often referred to as the Napoleon or the third Saatchi brother, this gentleman who claims that his last moment of clarity was when he climbed out of his mother's womb, built and reigned supreme over the world's largest advertising and marketing conglomerate that annually dispenses 75 billion advertising dollars to newspapers, magazines, television, radio, and digital companies, including Google and Facebook. In the ad world, no one is bigger or a bigger celebrity than Sir Martin Sorel. And he is here with us today to speak to us about how a black swan event such as COVID-19 is accelerating digital transformation. Over to you, Sonali, and over to you, Sir Martin Sorel. Thank you, Ivan. Um, <laughs> hi, Sonali. Hi, hi, Martin. This is my lucky lucky uh, month, at least COVID-19 has ensured that I interact with you much more frequently than I would have when the world was ordinary. So, see, uh, see on, on, online accelerates everything, Sonali. See, so it's all, all good news, all good news. Well, uh, for, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, the uninitiated in terms of uh, Martin Sura's spectacular career, I know Ivan has done a brief introduction but he is the Ad Mughal. And if anybody is going to give us some sense of what the world is going to look like, uh, you know, immediately uh, in the near future and maybe even long term, it's no other man than this one. So thank you so much, Martin. You're, 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 building, it, you're building it up, Ivan, and you are building it up so much that expectations are going to rise to an undeliverable height, Sonali. So, so you never temper, fail to disappoint. Temper. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, first things first, from the last time I spoke with you, uh, you know, things have eased a little bit across geographies. Even in India, we've seen a little bit of relaxation. Uh, how are you now sensing uh, consumer sentiment and more importantly, industry sentiment? Well, um, it's a fundamental question. I mean, my view... Uh, is that, uh, as Ivan said, and as you said, that digital disruption or digital transformation is accelerating as a result, a result of COVID-19. Ivan said it was a black, black swan event. Technically, it's not a black swan event because a black swan is an unknown unknown, to use Rumsfeld. This was a known unknown because uh, Bill Gates was warning us about it. Even President Trump had a report delivered to him in, uh, I think it was 2018, about pandemics, more from the angle of terrorists using uh, bio uh, technology, technological warfare. So it was written from that perspective, but the, the, the steps to be taken were there. I mean, the British government put together a plan in 2016 for dealing with pandemics, which the Singaporean government adopted because the British government never implemented it, which is one of the things that I'm sure will come out of the inevitable Royal Commission inquiry that, that, that comes as a result of COVID. Because the, you know, if I can be somewhat critical, the, the government here, in my view, easy to say after the event, reacted too slowly. And that is, you know, I've said that to you before, Sonali, I've said it publicly before, it's now starting to gather momentum. But having said all that, um, the lockdowns are easing, 
generally. Uh, you know, it, they've eased in India. I, I understand that Mumbai is still a flashpoint, to put it uh, mildly, and maybe Delhi as well. But certainly, uh, it, the battle against the virus is not over. There are there are noises now about Texas and uh, Arkansas. I think it is. Uh, and Arizona and Florida having second waves, and people are worried about that, particularly in Texas. Uh, South Korea, I think, is battling with uh, a reemergence. So we are going to get these these waves. But I think generally, from a digital point of view, there are three major effects. The first is at a consumer level. As you well know, and we're doing it now, we communicate more online. We're using technologies that are perfectly efficient, and, and I see you more virtually, as you rightly say, than I saw you when I visited India, which would, would tend to be once a year. I can do this all the time. And uh, communication. So one number one is communication. Number two is online shopping. Uh, you know, India uh, is in the midst uh, of an online shopping revolution, uh, a digital shopping revolution, whether it be uh, the um, the investment by Facebook and others, such as General Atlantic and and everybody else uh, in Geo, and taking a stake in that and seeing how that platform uh, aimed at the the, the thriving or uh, well, not so much now but historically thriving small business and medium sized business community in India, full of, of entrepreneurs who are not just economically important but politically important. Rumors of Amazon doing something with Sonoma Tao around Airtel. I mean, all these things indicate online shopping uh, is increasingly important. Alan Jope, who, who is head uh, CEO of Unilever, was CEO of Unilever China at the time of SARS, always says that when he was in China, after SARS, there was this revolution in online shopping as Chinese consumers opened up their accounts, trialed it. And in America at the moment, 32%, roughly a third of U.S. households are experiment, not experimenting, are using uh, online uh, shopping for groceries and essentials. So we're communicating online, we're shopping online. And the last thing, very importantly, we're educating our kids online or trying to. Technology is not as good as it should be, but it will develop further. Uh, curricula are not as good as they should be, but will develop further. So that's, that's the consumer. At a media level, and you know this from an Economic Times point of view and from your professional point of view, digital uh, is sweeping all before it. Rupert Murdoch is closing more than 100 titles in Australia because they've become uneconomic. Newspapers here, magazines in their paper versions are dropping like flies. Um, and this, you know, I, I, I hesitate to say this given who I'm talking to and the importance of, of the press and the likely continued importance of the press in India, but the physical press uh, is in decline elsewhere, and even in India, I think the statistics show it. And what COVID-19 has done is accelerate that decline. I'm not smart enough to figure out when exactly that's going to be, but whatever that date is, it's come forward as a result of COVID-19. You see uh, free-to-air television under attack, if I can put it that way, from the streamers, from Netflix from Disney Plus. Disney Plus, 50 million subscribers from a launch, probably the most successful launch that we've seen of a new, a new product. Outdoor, important in an Indian context. Digital outdoor, interestingly, growing. Traditional outdoor, in decline. So all these trends around media are being accelerated. I saw some free-to-air TV statistics here in the UK this morning. Uh, the older people like me, 75-year-old like me, are watching more television, which I do do, on lockdown. I also watch more streaming, by the way. Younger people, so the graph, but interestingly, during the lockdown, actually the, the viewing has started to, to, to decline. For younger people who start at a lower level because they're watching less live television, also rose lockdown, but come down quite sharply. So free-to-air TV and the switch to digital is becoming more important from a media point of view. And lastly, and most importantly, probably, the people who run enterprises, who run, who run companies, who before COVID-19 were hesitant to go ahead with digital disruption on transformation because it caused enormous change in their organizations. And even if they wanted to do it, 
the people who ran, who actually run the company, not the mucky mucks at the top, the top of the company, but the people who actually do the work, they were resistant to change too. Now all bets are off. Those days have gone. There is no status quo to disrupt. It's gone. Q2, uh, you know, in July and August, when companies report their Q2 results, we're gonna, there's going to be a lot of gloomy news. It will look like a bloodbath um, or, uh, across most industries. Tech will be less. Healthcare will be less. Online shopping will be less. Home entertainment. You know, I see the markets are in a, in, in a, a, down, a downdraft this, today, but I was just looking at the prices and Netflix is up. And home entertainment and games will be more V-shaped, as they, as they would say. So, Sonali, I think that's, that's the encapsulates it. It's, it's, it's digital acceleration. It's not anything, well, there are some new stuff happening, and working from home, city centers becoming less attractive from an office point of view, from a residential point of view, disbursement of people, travel being less, and we, come, we can develop that further. But I think at its core, what you're seeing is an acceleration of change at a consumer level, at a media level, and last but not least, at an enterprise level. I completely uh, buy, buy that, that, that we would see these changes. But I want you to focus on emerging markets such as India. While, yeah. yes, the, the top end of the pyramid, for sure. I mean, we have no option. We will embrace all of this. And we already have. Uh, but with, with India, as you're very well aware, much of the population is poor, uneducated, and not skilled. Uh, when you look at economies such as ours, uh, how does that transformation uh, go through, really, when you talk about digital transformation? Well, uh, you, you know, I worry about uh, India in that context, and I worry about uh, other countries like Brazil in that context. I'm probably a little bit less worried about China in that context. Um, you know, the rise of populism that we've seen, if you, you, you know, if you wanted to, uh, to say what was the cause of the rise of populism in the West, is, is re really the around- In the East, and in the East. Well, no, I'm talking about in the West first. Okay. In the okay. West. Um, the rise of inequality in the West, uh, you know, whether it be the US uh, and the UK, and, and Western Europe uh, and, and other Western markets has been driven uh, by what's happened since Thatcherite economics and Reaganite economics were really implemented in the 1980s. If you look, Ray Dalio, who's a famous hedge fund money, has a wonderful graph, or several actually, but a wonderful graph which shows capital as a proportion of GDP rising in the 1980s on up, and labor as a proportion of GDP declining. That's the fundamental reason for the rise of, of populism within countries because of inequality. I think an unfortunate con consequence of COVID-19 is the potential threat to the inequality, if you like, between so-called developed, and I dislike the phrase developing because Many of the developing countries fast do have they're fast growing. Yeah, exactly. And and I and I do, but I worry seriously worry that that the results of COVID nineteen, that the 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 consequences are going to be serious in driving further inequality between countries as well as within countries. And so that's the bad news. Now, thinking about what's happening and how we pay for all this. I mean, the fiscal and monetary largesse, which we heard from Chairman Powell of the Federal Reserve yesterday, will continue certainly to 2022, zero interest rates, uh, that the, the impact of COVID-19 is, is going to be a longer one than the markets were, were expecting, certainly up until the last 24 to 48 hours. Um, the implication of that, who's going to pay for this? I mean, the, the, the fiscal monetary stimulus is huge. Nobody I, I've seen has managed to calculate, but the world is $75 trillion. We see the Americans throwing in $3 trillion. You know, Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, says, when a journalist says, you know, are you going to do more? He said, it's a couple of weeks ago, he said, well, we just put two, $3 trillion in. Give us 14 days to figure out what the impact of all this has been. 
You see the Japanese dunking in a trillion, you know, one day. You see the Europeans putting in 750 billion euros. You see the UK putting in 800 billion sterling. I mean, it's huge. It's certainly, and I talked to leading fund managers about this, it's certainly 15 to 30% wide range of global GDP of that $75 trillion. It's huge. Who's going to pay for all this? And the answer is, I think, that despite what politicians say, particularly in front of elections, for obvious reasons, by increased taxation, uh, not just of individuals, but of corporations. So, for example, in America, when Trump took the President Trump took the corporate tax rate down from 28 to 21, Biden, in his election program, has corporate rates going back up to 28. That is a canary in the coal mine, in my view. That is an indication that to pay for all this, I don't think, you know, some people liken what happened on coronavirus or is happening to the, I think it is a recession that is more like wartime than 9-11 or the dot-com bust or the great financial crisis. I mean, it, it affects everybody, not equally. All that nonsense about it affecting everybody implied it affect pe people equally. Totally wrong. It affects the disadvantaged and the underprivileged more than the privileged uh, and and the and the wealthy. But yeah. you know the the knock the knock on effect of this, I think, will be that it's going to reverse those lines that Ray Dal Dalio drew, or as on his capital as a proportion of GDP will decline, and labor as a proportion of GDP will increase. So that will reduce inequality. I think it'll make the rich squeal. It'll make corporations squeal, uh, but I think it's almost inevitable. I think we're, we're witnessing in the West certainly a tipping point. Now, in the, in the developing countries, I think the consequences could be very serious. And talking to the people I talk to in India, who I've got to know over the years, I know that they're worried about that. I think they're extremely worried about the issue that you raised, the rising inequality. So there has to be a lot of you know, if I put it crudely, social engineering going on here. There has to be significant investment, education, retraining, hardware, software. And, you know, if I call out again the sort of things that we're seeing, I think the Facebook investment in Geo is really symptomatic or emblematic of what I'm talking about. That is the sort of thing, and I think it's very far-sighted by Mukesh Ambani, and I think it's very far-sighted by Mark Zuckerberg, uh, isn't you know, that free basics? He tried free basics. He tried free, free basics in India on his own. He failed miserably. And now he's gone via the geo route because Reliance is a powerful player. I mean, so it's just free basics masked. Well, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a very cynical way of putting it. If at first you don't succeed, try, try, try again. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. That's the three basic uh, rules in life. You know, persistence is a virtue. but but I, I do think it captures the importance of the changes that are taking place. But I agree with your question or thrust behind your question that it is deeply worrying. I'm not so worried about China. You know, China, uh, you know, I'm worried about the decoupling between the U.S. and China. Uh, that decoupling poses or gives a tremendous opportunity for India. You know, the if supply chains... Our global supply chains are under threat. This is this is like I remember when I was trying to run WPP. You know, we got hacked in the Ukraine that Mekong crisis. Uh, we we chose the wrong payroll software system apparently, and we were hacked. The other one, if you chose the other system, we weren't hacked. Supposedly by you know who it is uh, the, the the government that that hacked in to try to destabilize the Ukrainian Ukrainian re regime, but. The advice we got from the IT engineers were, you know, the advice up until that point in time is make sure you've got a fully integrated network. Their advice after we got hacked was dis disaggregate. Pick out those markets where you think you're vulnerable like Ukraine and build a wall around them. So same thing with the global supply chain. The, the advice before was, you know, just-in-time inventory, keep it all tight, keep it low cost, make sure that everything's integrated. Post the decoupling, because I think we are going to see the U.S. and China decouple, sadly, and globalization, uh, sadly, under more and more threat. 
but I think the consequence of that for India is quite interesting because India has already, uh, there have been moves to make India a more stable manufacturing base. So there are some good things that come out of that, but that decoupling between the US and China, and I you know, have a strong, just as much as I have a strong affection for India, I have a strong affection for China. They have, they have coming back to your central question about you know, making sure that poverty is eradicated or eradicated as much as possible. We may, you, you may disagree in India with the state controlled capitalist system, but it has delivered in terms of taking hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And the Chinese are not going to go away. They were on the wrong side of history for a couple hundred years, they believe, or some of them believe. They're going to be on the right side of history. And there's no you stopping. Still, you still think no that? The, I, I, I know you said India and China will be on the right side of history. Uh, you know, I've, and you've said you've maintained this every time we met in India or in Cannes. But the point is, do you still agree with that now? Do you think China will be yes. on the right side of history? Yes. Still? Yes, I, I, I do. I do. If I look at, let me parochialize it to S4. Currently, we have 70% of our revenues in North and South America and 20 in Western Europe and 10% in Asia Pacific. I want it to be 40, 20, 40. Why? I still think North America and South America will be driving forces. South America is a great continent. You know, we just we just picked up another business in Argentina. We're going to shortly pick up another business in data analytics, which has sort of similar similar roots. There is great creative talent, great technological talent there. There is in India too. There's great creative. You know, some of my ex colleagues at, uh, or maybe they continue to be my colleagues, like Pierce and. Uh, at Ogilvy, outstanding creative talent, not just in an Indian context, not just in an Asian Pacific context, but on a worldwide context. And, you know, the, the mucky mucks in London and New York who think they are the center of creativity, you know, the, the Don Drapers or the, the, the former John Don Drapers or people who still think they're the Don Drapers, you know, they're, 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 they're snotty nosed about, about the, other countries around the world, wrongly so, because these are countries that are, are extremely strong. So I remain, you know, with 1.2 billion people in India, with 1.3, 1.4 billion in China, and with India becoming the most populous country on the planet, I have absolutely no doubt whatsoever. I'm still a raging bull wow. on India and indeed China. So why am I interested? Why, from a parochial point of view, I'm self-interested point of view, as for capital interest point of view, do I? Do I think India is important? It's just because it is going to be successful. And I think Prime Minister Modi has done a great job on rebranding or repositioning or strengthening the position uh, of, of India, not just in, in an Asian context, but in a worldwide context. And I hope he will continue to do so. So I think that the weather set, uh, that, you know, there is a tailwind uh, there are some advantages. You know, the decoupling gives India sort of a lot of wiggle room, in my view, to, to you know, Britain has to do the same scenario. You know, we're coming out of Europe. Sadly, I still think that was a mistake. But we're coming out of Europe. So we have to position ourselves between America, between China. We have to develop better relationships, trading relationships with India. It's going to be a tough task for the Foreign Office. You know, how do you negotiate a free trade treaty with U.S. at the same time as you're trying to do it with China, and both markets are critically important. Tough stuff, very tough stuff. It's very delicate politically. You know, the American administration has made very clear what they think Britain should do with regard to Chinese technology, etc. So it's going to be a it's going to be a tough a tough situation. But there's plenty of opportunities that come out of this for India. As long as the, as well as the challenges that you mentioned in your question. Yeah, uh, you've always been an optimist, and, and you know, very affectionate towards India, and much kinder than 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 the reality, I would say. Uh, having said that, <laughs> your uh, your reality, your reality, not mine. <laughs> uh, I, I was, I, I mean, there were many interesting points to pick up from what you just said, but. I mean, I'd like to ask you, there's been much debate about globalization and whether globalization will be the same way 
you talked about uh, you know india and china i'm, I'm going to leave india out of the equation for now because we're a different story compared to china uh there has been increasing uh yes india and china at loggerheads now india and china at loggerheads as well and uh we see, we're also seeing a lot of global hate towards china uh because of the virus whether it's justified or not is another debate uh you know completely How, with, with this reality do you look at globalization and you know the world betting on a uh, one country as its manufacturing hub and betting on on one country for its supply chain going forward or do you think more and more countries are going to look within as you know prime minister modi has already announced the atmanirbhar program which if i translate is being self reliant uh, and i'm assuming more and more companies are going to look deeply within and try and be more self reliant is that a concern for globalization well it, it, yes i just think uh You know, just as I referred to, I think that that capital slice, that capital graph and labor graph reversing, I think the trend towards globalization, sadly, because I think it brought huge benefits. But we did, we we who benefited, you know, Davos man or Davos woman, didn't explain it adequately. Uh, you know, it, it it lost in the polls. You know, that's the reason. that the british voter wanted to take back control from the eu from brussels that's why trump you know beat clinton in 16 so you know we didn't explain it successfully but i think one of the things is there will be more self reliance but you know that gives what will happen i think is there will be two systems two basic fundamental systems there'll be a us oriented system and a chinese oriented system and i i, I do think You know, President Trump comes in for a lot of criticism, but to be fair to him, American withdrawal took place under President Obama. The the trend to withdrawal, you know, I visited um, uh, Nigeria and Pakistan for the first time last year. I went to Lagos uh, and Lahore, and in both cases, you know, when I landed there, one of the one of the things that hit me in the eye was who is the answer to the question of who is the biggest fdi investor in both those countries and the answer is china so as america has withdrawn from many parts of the world for you know understandable political reasons maybe or domestic political reasons it is less of a vacuum and the chinese are expert at developing their soft power you know throughout latin america throughout africa throughout asia south china sea we see what's happening in hong kong i was interviewed forgive me for mentioning the financial times but a woman who runs the financial times um in in uh, in asia australian woman. and you know she said to me you know we were talking about hong kong and the chinese government's moves in hong kong and she said you know taiwan will be next now i don't know whether that's right or not um but you know the we we've awakened the dragon if you like and um the, the chinese you know are, are not are upset you know I, I, as far as i mean the virus which you alluded to did did seem to emanate from wuhan and from the wet food markets in wuhan and you know if you read some of the the articles but there was a particularly good piece by Reuters actually on this which goes into some depth as to uh, the origins of, of the virus in Wuhan and when it was detected uh, etc and there's even a Harvard study that talks about infections as far back as October and there does seem to have been some delay um and delay in dealing with pandemics you know is is literally fatal that does seem to have been some delay uh, in notifying and developing and that delay then expanded to the UK where the UK government you know up until early march there was no lockdown here you know we we still had people cavorting through airports untested there is a reason this is going to be a big issue uh here in the UK it already is a big issue but you know the the failure to act quickly uh and to 
to shut down airports. I mean, I, I know, I, know I, I believe that the UK government knew that the mortality rate <clears throat> from the virus in early February, late January, they knew, looking at the Chinese mortality rates, they knew it could be 300,000 to 500,000. Martin, they, that was they, the case with most of us. Most of us did not go into lockdown until, you know, no, mid that was, a, that was a bit yes, but there were there were. Look at New Zealand. I was talking to people in New Zealand yesterday, uh, early in the morning here in London, and you know, twenty deaths in total lockdown. Now you can isolate a country like New Zealand, given population and space, etc., much more easily. I understand that. But, you know, Singapore did the same. So Singapore took that plan. That the British government had in 2016 and used it themselves. They, but they implemented it. And so th there are, look, we have to look at it. The, our prime minister was questioned on his daily press conference yesterday. Uh, and, you know, a reporter very passionately said, don't you admit that you made a mistake? And, you know, look, I hesitate to say this, but I will. It's like the weapons of mass destruction. Remember, Bush and Blair made a decision to, to invade on the basis of bad information, it turned out, for whatever reason. Whether there was emotion there, they made a bad decision. And I, I, I think that as we review what we did in relation to this, to this, this known unknown, what, what you could call a black swan, you know, we were all caught by surprise. And the other thing is the reverse is true also, Sonali. When, when, when you get caught out, what do you do? You overreact the other way. So what did they do? They locked down and they stayed locked down. And our prime minister, bless him, thank goodness, didn't die from corona, but he could have died, according to his account of what happened to him in the hospital. So his, his psychology is going to be more conservative now. So you, you, you're, not, you're not conservative at the beginning. And you become too, big, too conservative at the end. I mean, the whole thing is, round the wrong way, in a way. So, understandable, but yeah, you know, I think uh, this is going to be a big, big issue here in this country as to whether you know, we should have reacted in a different way. Um, but net-net... Um, yeah, that's is 2020. Where, so, so, yeah. Uh, I have a so, question uh, from the audience. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would love to keep asking you questions, but I have to take some from them. Uh, picking up from the point of Facebook's investment in Geo, will COVID-19 pave the path for a series of acquisitions and investments in Indian companies with the government possibly taking a clear stand on FDI in media? Well, you know more about that than I would. Uh, do I think, look, even before covid there, there was private equity has about a trillion dollars of unlevered equity. The credit markets now are, are not shut, but they are much, much more difficult. So they have access to more than a trillion. They may have access to three or four trillion or whatever it is in total uh, as a result. In old days, it, they could lever it five or six times. Um, so you're talking about huge amounts of money. There were stories in the media before COVID about private equity starting to make big investments in Asia Pacific. They didn't tended to do it, but not on scale. That's going to come. I mean, India, as a private equity destination, uh, Asia, you know, Vietnam, Indonesia, Bangladesh, whatever it happens to be, Austria, even the older markets, more mature markets of Japan, we already started to see that in, in, in our own industry when you know ADK was bought by Bain Capital uh, in, in Japan, Australia, New Zealand. You're going to see more of it. Uh, I mean, that that is certain to happen. So there will be more investment. The Facebook investment in Geo and then the surrounding investors in Geo as well to take the 20% stake will stimulate. You now, Amazon will jump in, as, as we've seen comments in the press, and there'll be more. You know, what will happen with, with Vodafone idea in mm. India? I mean, all these things are going to come under increasing scrutiny by capital, because there's a lot of surplus capital, a lot of free capital for trying to find a home, then that will trigger the response from the relative governments. It could be India, it could be Vietnam, it could be Indonesia, it could be all of the above. And that's going to trigger a response and a concern about whether these companies should fall into the hands 
of foreign investors. I mean, I, I have a little bit of a thing with private equity that, you know, just in the way I think public markets tend to look be too short term, I think private equity is too short term. Their, their average hold period is about five years. And I think that's too short. And I think that that tends to drive people to cost-based decisions and cost-cutting and a reduction in employment as a result, which I think is a serious issue. I think you know, one, I have control, voting control of S4, uh, and that's something that I was, particularly after my experience at WPP, I was, I was really concerned about because I think it enables you to take a longer-term view. This separation of ownership and control, yeah. which in most in the in the capitalist system in most listed companies you have where management doesn't control that management is in is in control of the organization but they don't have ownership the separation of ownership and control is not is not i think you know, nobody at wpp on the board of wpp owns any stock in the company it's not an entrepreneurial company one of the strengths of the indian companies is their it, their their, their Indian entrepreneurial origins, Mahindra, Bharti, you know, Ambani. I mean, all these people are, are people, Sunil Natal, all these people are highly driven, highly successful Indian entrepreneurs. And I think where you get this ownership and control as one, it works. Where there's separation, I think it causes problems. So, I, and the answer to your question is, I think it is an issue that's going to become more and more significant because whilst there might not be as much globalization, there'll probably be more globalization of the investment. Sure, sure. Well, I think uh, we've completely run out of time. I could chat with you for another hour. Uh, unfortunately, I have to wrap. Thank you so much again for your time. Thank, Thank you again you, for your plain speak. And uh, hopefully I'll see you soon. Okay, God bless you. And Thank stay you. safe and well. You too. Thank you. Bye. All I'd like to say in conclusion, Sir Martin Sorel, is that you have more than lived up to the build-up. So thank you very much for your time and thank you, Sonali. Thank you, Ivan. You're most welcome.